My presentation is on facial recognition, and I actually broke it into a couple of parts, so I'm just going to do part one tonight, uh, which is a segment of facial uh, recognition, which is actually detecting faces. So I'll go over the problem definition, a little history of what folks are trying to do with uh, facial recognition, show you some code and some concepts that go along with it, and then do a demo at the end. Uh, so there's a, a really good book that kind of has the whole, um, everything you want to know and more about uh, facial recognition. It's called The Handbook of Facial Recognition. It's really thick. Um, it's a horrible thing to try to learn from, but it's great if you want a good survey and be able to look up, you know, what's available to do. Uh, and they define it in there as a, a uh, visual pattern recognition problem where the face is assumed to be 3D, um, that is subject to varying things that throw the facial recognition process off, illumination, pose, expression, and other factors. And you have a whole set of images that you're trying to collect and identify. Uh, so there are two things uh, to this. There is facial detection, which is, answers the question, where's the face? So in this photograph, there are a lot of things that are there. There's a zip drive in the back, there's some books, um, there's actually the body, but what we're trying to do is extract from an image just the segment that represents the face. And then the facial recognition, who is this? Uh, so this presentation is entirely focused on just that first part, which is you have an image, go find the face in it, see if you can determine where it is. And then future parts of this series that I'm hoping to do a couple of these will actually delve into facial recognition and some of the other techniques. So we'll start with this. So there have been a number of attempts to uh, really learn about uh, facial recognition. A lot of research um, starting in 1973, the first automated system happened. Um, then there was a principal component analysis. Um, Eigenface in 1991 was really a major milestone. There's a new technique um, that's used and there are now a lot of variants of this. And uh, Fisher Face is one that uh, builds on that. And then in 2001, uh, there is a uh, two researchers, Viola and Jones, that came up with a way of detecting faces uh, that uses something called Ada Boost and a horror cascade, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And then there's an even more recent thing called Gabor Jets. All right, so starting with um, how can a computer find a face? Well, there are a number of ways you can do it just like we do. When we're looking at something, we do the, a lot of the same processing as humans. So you look at the skin color that helps you pick out, um, you know, from the background image versus what's a face. And this is only really uh, useful in color images, or it's most useful in color images. There's motion, so if you're trying to capture something from video, obviously if someone talks, you can detect that the mouth is moving, and that's a way you can detect the area where the face is. And then the head shape, you know, there's a silhouette against a background, so you can look for that pattern in the data and, uh, and find a face. And then all of these combine in various ways. Um, there are a number of different algorithms that are, are appearance-based. Um, versus learning base versus like doing a neural network or something like that to try to figure out um, where the face is. Most of the modern algorithms are based on this, this thing called a Viola Jones object detection framework, which is based on hard cascades, which is an appearance-based model. So now that I've mentioned that crazy term called a hard cascade a couple of times, let me explain what it is. Um, so there are two parts to it. There's the hard part and there's the cascade part. And so a cascade is a series of har-like features um, that are combined to, to form a classifier. But the question is, what is a har-like feature? And so a har wavelet is a mathematical function that actually produces um, a square, square wave output. And so when they say har-like features, what they're really talking about is these, these features, these patterns here are rectangular. That's really all that means, a har-like feature. It's a, it's a rectangular pattern in data. So you can imagine if you have uh, something that you're trying to match and you wanted to find an edge, you could find one area that is lighter than the other area, that is darker, and that might indicate an edge of some sort in your picture. And you can see there are different orientations of it, uh, you know, going vertically, horizontally, and even diagonally. The original um, set of features that they did in Viola Jones only had, I think, like four or five features. This is a more modern version that has uh, the diagonal features as well. And it, and it has uh, several different lengths. So you can see line feature A has basically one segment and then, uh, you know, 33% of it is black and then here it's, it's divided into fourths. So there are two black sections there. All right, so the way that it works is you pick a scale for these features. Um, and what you do is you slide it across an image and at the scale you're looking at, you take a sum of everything that's under the, uh, 
window that's that's colored white, and then everything that's under black, and you and you take the average of each side, and then if the difference between those two sides is some threshold, then you know that that particular um, feature matched the data that was underneath it. Um, so that's the difference, and, and the black and white don't necessarily indicate that one's greater or less than the other. It's just the difference between the two. So the the white side could actually be the darker, and the dark side could actually be the lighter, and it, but. But the idea here, they could have colored these like gold and blue or something, but they just colored them black and white. And the idea is that um, what you'll do is you'll just do this calculation where you take an average of one area and the other. And you can do it at a different scale. So you could basically take half the entire image and see if the left half was lighter on average than the right half. And that could indicate the presence or absence of a feature. So how could you use this to detect a face? So here's this poor guy that's got a horror-like feature on him. And you can see that. The nose is going to be different than the eyes, right? So if you had it, this horror-like feature and you did that, and this is actually one of the things that they, they did initially to, to figure this out, is they said, well, look, this kind of matches the, the region of the face where the eyes and nose are. It's going to follow that pattern at, the, at that scale there. And so that's the horror feature 2A. Again, the feature is just a, a pattern in the data. And so if you actually did that computation, you would find for most people's eyes and most pictures, it's actually going to, going to match that feature. Um, but that's not enough, really, because there are other things that can match that feature, too. I mean, obviously, the little zip drive thing has some things, like the word zip and, he, and the, the white areas here could match it as well. So it's not enough just to use this one feature and be able to say, this area is a face, because that would actually a match a bunch of different things in that picture. And the reason it would do it, as you go through this, with these classifiers, you try them out at different scales. So you, you, know, you start big, and you can go small. And the idea is you kind of zero in on where the feature is that you're looking for. So a single classifier isn't accurate enough. It's actually called a weak classifier. And, and by that, um, what you mean is it does classify accurately, but, it, but it's above 50% and kind of barely over 50%. Um, it's not, you know, you're not hitting 75, 80% accuracy with these things. These weak classifiers are just typically just barely better than 50% correct. Um, and so what a horror cascade is, is a bunch of those weak classifiers combine in a particular order that have been trained over a period of time to figure out that when you combine these series of you know, 200 classifiers in this order, um, it's going to give you a pretty high accuracy rate that what you've discovered, uh, that, that if all those features match, it must be a face. And so the way it works is, and there are different variations on this, some of them actually have probabilistic stuff where it's not pass-fail, but the simplest version is pass-fail. So you start with hard feature one for a particular area of the image you're looking for. And if you pass, you go on to two and three. And you keep looking at that sub-images sub within that image to find if it matches all the features you need for a, fa for a face. If any one of them fail, it fails. So uh, it's a quick exit. You have to pass all the features to be a face. So the question is, how do you combine, if you have this idea of combining these weak classifiers into one strong classifier, how would you do that? And so what this algorithm they came up with was called AdaBoost. And actually, they didn't come up with it. Someone else came up with it, but no one really had an application for it until Hard Cascades. So it kind of came into its own um, after Hard Cascades decided that, that was the, they needed a training algorithm, and this really fit the bill for them. Uh, so what AdaBoost does is it, is it tries out multiple weak classifiers over several rounds. And so it tries out all these classifiers, and it says, is it a face or not? And it already knows whether the area, it already knows where the face is. So it's, it's a uh, supervised learning kind of algorithm. It already knows what the right answer is. And so it looks at the, the data point, you know, the area of the face that it's looking at, and says whether it passes or fails. And then it picks, of all the different classifiers that are there, it picks the one that is matching the, the correct data, um, matching most frequently. So you try all the different pictures, you know, round one, classifier one, what did it do? Um, it has some pretty clever features, too. So AdaBoost can actually use classifiers that are consistently wrong by reversing their direction. So if they get a classifier that's always wrong, well, you just reverse the decision, and now it's going to be always right, right, in the ideal situation. So it has a pretty clever feature that you can use bad, um, bad classifiers to get good results. Um, the weight update step um, can be designed so it only updates on the misses. Um, and the original way of doing this 
um, and there have been some improvements, but it can actually take weeks of processing time to determine what the final cascade sequence is. Now that's developing the cascade sequence. When it runs, it runs really fast, but developing it is, can, be, can be slow. And then what happens is after you get this series of features um, that work, and typically folks start out with 24 by 24 pixels, sometimes they do 36 by 36. Um, now you have this whole series. Those, each of those features can then be scaled because sometimes you take a picture and you're really close up or the face is really far away. And so what um, you do is you start out at a, at a scale for the whole, cl whole classifier, and then you increase or decrease it by 0.125 uh, as a multiplier. And uh, then it's going to be able to find faces of different sizes. So that's what it does. That's how you create a whole list of these features that you run against an image to see where, where the face is. Um, but then you have another problem, and they solved really cleverly in the Viola Jones framework. They, they have this idea of an integral image, um, and they needed to be able to compute the differences in those areas really quickly. Now, the sort of the naive way to do this, if you're telling me you have to compare this area to this area, I'll go and I'll sum up all the things and write a little for loop, you know, nested for loop, and another little nested for loop over here, and add them up together, and however many pixels were, you divide by that, and you get the average by each side. The thing is, that doesn't work really well if you have to go through 200 of those to um, actually find the face, and that's typically what most of these classifiers are, is somewhere in that neighborhood of 200 of these, of these rounds of classifiers. So that's not very fast. Um, so they came up with this idea. It's called an integral image, or also known as a summed area table. It, you create it in a single pass. So what they do basically do is they pre-compute the sum of everything going across, and then they use a little bit of clever math to actually be able to compute the area of any, any region within an image just by doing a simple addition and subtraction, which is really neat. So um, let's see here. This, if you have an original image here that's got pixel values 5, 2, 3, and 6, what you do is you actually sum using this formula so that it becomes 5, 7, 8, and 16. And then you can use that information to just look up what the sum would be. And so the formula is this. If you want to find the sum of all the pixel values in a particular area, you just take the sum of A plus the sum of D plus the sum of, uh, minus the sum of B minus the sum of C. And that gives you the answer. And it takes about, on most processors, it's like 60 instructions um, in, the, in the actual microprocessor instructions. So it's really, really fast. And so for an example here, you have um, an integral image here. This is the original image, and these are pixel values. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, typically when they do this, they do it in grayscale. So the values only go from 0 to 255. Just makes the whole computation simpler. So these are obviously very low numbers, just to make it easy. This adds up to 39. So w the correct answer here is we want to be able to add up all these pixels, um, and then you should get 39. Now, obviously, brute force, you can go through and write a for loop and do this. But if you do a summed area table, you go through once, and then for this particular reason, region, the way that this is defined is A is going to be diagonally from here. B is going to be one above your rightmost corner. C is one over. And then D is actually within the image that you're trying to, trying to look at. And if you actually do that formula, it's kind of neat, but it does work. It actually gives you 39. So you can see if you were going over you know, a span of 200 pixels, you're not going through those 200 pixels. You only deal with four pixels and add them in the special way and you get the sum under there and then you can you know take the average if you want pretty easily as well. All right, so that's how it's done and then there's a tool, there are a number of tools out there that do this. So one I encountered recently actually is this o open image and it actually stands for intelligent multimedia analysis in Java is the image part. Um, and I think it was written in the UK. And so I use that to, to write a little demo for this horror cascade thing. And then I also used Twitter Bootstrap um, for the GUI just because I hadn't used it before and it was kind of a lightweight thing. So if you guys want to do the demo, if you go, you can go to your phone. If you're connected to the uh, NIC uh, internet, you can just go to this IP address. Um, that's what my, I'm currently assigned here and uh, surf to it. And I'm actually going to show you here as well. Uh, so it's 192.168.13.181 for anybody that wants to do that. I'm sure someone uh, devious will try to crash the browser. None of these crash my server. I did not design this for performance or security in any way. It's just demo. So if you're feeling ruthless, go ahead. But it won't be as fun if you, uh, if you try to stress test this thing. So it's, it's uh, at the top here, 192.168.13.181. 
And there, there is a quirk in here too. I'll tell you about it in a minute. So the first thing you do want to do. So I had this idea that if you ever watched that show, Person of Interest, where they're, you know, they have all these cameras everywhere and they're um, tracking all these people and doing their GPS. So I, I had this idea that you have subjects and then you're finding them in various places. And what this is actually doing is I'm sort of forcing you to categorize the data. So the new subject is going to say, let's let's say it's me. And I put it in here, and I add a new subject. All right. I don't know, people have already gotten ahead of me. All right. So then you go and you add a new image uh, for that particular subject, right? So I pick a file. And this is not me, but we'll pretend it's me. And I add a new new image. And then you'll notice it's asking me if, if um, you know, I'm going to let this application use my computer's location. So I'm going to say, yeah. What I actually did is I did um, some GPS stuff in there. So I asked the navigator for your current coordinates. And then when you submit a picture, I actually know where you were and the timestamp was when you take it. So for a future demo that adds on to this, I've got some other information that uh, will probably be useful that, for that. And of course, it's a demo, so it's obviously not going to show up. Right? Let's, see. Let's see here. Did anyone get it to work? It was working. OK, here we go. So, so here's, here's the pretend me. And you can see that it, uh, it actually did identify the correct location for the face. Now, with this particular heart cascade, it's not identifying the whole face. It, kind of, it tends to cut off some section of it, but it identifies kind of the main, the main portion of the face. And then if you upload more, you can play with it. Um, Twitter Bootstrap has this really nice carousel function, so you can upload multiple um, images to this thing. And um, let's see here. Pick another one. Let's get to add a new one. All right. And now I've got two, and you can kind of scroll and see all the things that you were there. And if you look, if you look at the bottom too, you'll see the caption. It tells you that when it was taken and what the lat long was at the time that you took it. Uh, it's a great question. So the question was, how does it handle multiple faces? And the answer is, I have it uh, set to only do one, but the particular library I'm using will return a whole list of everything it thinks is a face. Um, but I just take the first one, which is the most likely one. But yeah, if you actually did this with a picture of like a soccer team or something, it would actually go and identify all the faces in there for you. Good question. How did you learn this? I mean, you said that book was not very good. Where did you start? Um, where did I start? Uh, a lot of different places. I kind of pieced things together from the internet. Um, there was um, a good tutorial. I can send it to you. I have it bookmarked somewhere. It explained the integral image, and I blogged on it a while ago. Um, that's where I started getting interested in when I started getting interested in it. And then I found this open image library, which makes it really easy to do a lot of this stuff. So I played with it. Um, there's a number of different things. I've downloaded probably five or 10 different versions of this, but the open image seems to be the most mature open source uh, thing that's out there. Great question. Any other questions before we go eat? Can you tell I'm hungry? All right, thanks guys.